Welcome everybody, it's Gihan Pereira here. So welcome to this webinar, which is all about managing change, how, how you deal with change. And uh, of course, change is something that we're, we're all facing at the moment, regardless of our, our role, our business, our industry, our sector. And I want to give you some strategies and some, um, some processes for you to be able to manage change effectively. And uh, I I've uh, aimed this webinar because I do a lot of work with organizations who are going through a lot of change and I work with their leaders and I also work with their team members and this is very much aimed at both levels. So these strategies are relevant for you regardless of your role in the organization and regardless of what change process you're going through. So we've got about 45 minutes together so we'll work through some of these strategies. I like to make my webinars quite interactive so there'll be plenty of opportunities for you to ask questions along the way and we'll do a couple of little interesting exercises as well. And and the more that you contribute to those exercises, the more value you'll get out of this webinar. Uh, I'm recording this, and uh, if you're watching this, if you're here live, then you'll be able to get access to the recording later as well. So don't feel that you have to be frantically taking down notes from everything I say, but please do take notes as we go uh, as well, because I think you'll find some valuable things uh, that you can put into practice immediately. Okay, here are my three broad rules of engagement for, for all my webinars. So first of all, I want to give you the chance to think a little bit differently. So bl block out other distractions, turn off your email, try to get into a quiet space, and you've got 45 minutes together to do a little bit of thinking and also to be a little bit playful. So there'll be some opportunities for you to think a little bit creatively, think out of the box, think about things that you wouldn't necessarily do in your normal day-to-day -day work, but it's better to go that way for the next 45 minutes and then decide which of them you're going to take away and put into action later. It's easier to do it that way, to do big picture thinking now and then walk it back a little bit than to just play small and then try to expand later. And there are a lot of people in today's webinar who I don't know, uh, who haven't been on my webinars before, which is fine, it's great. Uh, I've opened up this webinar not only to clients but to um, the team members of clients and to other people in my network as well. So if you don't know me, I'm a futurist. I do a lot of conference keynote presentations as well as run workshops and strategic planning. And I have a, a, a leadership coaching program for, for leaders who are going through change. I'll tell you a little bit about that at the end, um, but we won't spend too much time on that now. I've worked with a number of organizations around Australia, New Zealand, and other parts of the world, and um, many of them at a leadership level. So this is just a small sample of the organizations I've worked with, and I picked the ones where I've worked at a leadership level with them in various ways, with this conference keynotes or strategic planning or in other ways. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because you can see there's a diverse range of organizations here, government, non-government, uh, not-for-profit, um, large corporations, smaller corporations, private, um, and so on. And many of them are going through similar sort of issues when it comes to change. So these strategies that we talk about today will apply across the board. Okay, so let's start off with uh, what's your main role at work. I'd like to know who's in the room. So let's just do a quick poll. And the way that the polls work for the people who haven't seen this before, are very simple. So I've got for you, um, these are very broad categories here, but you'll see the poll on the screen now. So I just choose one of the options. So the polls are anonymous um, and uh, the people, the rest of the people in the room don't see, not that this is a particularly confidential one, but we'll see who's in the room because it'll, first of all, it'll help you understand who else is in the room with you, in the virtual room with you, and also it'll help me because I can then make sure that the content can be tailored to the people in the room. Okay, great. So almost everybody has um, has voted or nominated. So let me close the poll now. Oh, hundred percent have voted. Thank you for doing it so quickly. Okay, so let's see who we've got. Yeah, excellent. So these are people, so most people here are, are working within organizations. So a couple of business owners, but most of the people here are working within organizations and actually quite a lot at quite a senior level. So this webinar and the strategies we're talking about when it comes to change do apply to you and your team members as well. So if you are if you fall into one of those categories where you're a business owner, a senior manager, or a team leader, and you're, you also got not just yourself, but you've also got team members to consider, then wear these two hats. So one is, of course, how do you deal with change? But the second one is, 
what strategies can you use for your team members to bring them along on the change journey with you? Because that's, that's a crucial part of making change happen is that you've got your team members along the, on the journey with you. The next question I want to ask, uh, so I just want to get these two questions to set the context of who's in the room and what uh, what are the issues that people are facing. So in this case, it's not a poll because I don't exactly know uh, what your responses are going to be, but you'll see in the question box that you can type a question. And actually what I'd like you to do now is actually type an answer. And I'm going to keep this anonymous, so whatever you type, I'll read out the answer, but I won't read out uh, what, you, what you've said. So what are the biggest changes you're facing right now? And let's talk about in your work life, in your professional life. Okay, so the question box is open and if you just type in the question box, I will read out what people have typed in. Implementing a new initiative, business process change, restructure, a Royal Commission. Okay, yeah, actually I know this person, so I know what that one is specifically. A change of direction and new ownership. Yeah, restructure and EBA discussions in quick quick succession. Yeah, so really some interesting people issues there. Ah, okay, here's an interesting one. We need change, but the company is slow to respond to the environment. Okay, excellent. So th thank you again for, for responding quickly. If there any others have come through, I'll, re I'll read them out for you as well. But you can see just from the few that I've read out, so there's things like restructures, change of direction, business process change, um, EBA discussions, uh, and the company's slow to respond. There's there's a variety of where, uh, changes that people are facing now. And uh, I often get brought into organizations and they say to me, we're going through a major organizational change process at the moment. And we're, um, and I think, and I say to them, you know, who else is? Everybody, because there's so much change happening outside that we have to be constantly running change management. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember when there's a whole bunch of change management happening in the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s. And now it's just, it's not uh, an initiative that, uh, that you're undertaking. It's happening because the world's changing around us. And just a couple of others that have come in, giving priority to significant high level strategic changes. Yep. Okay, good. All right. So let's start with a little exercise, a little personal exercise for yourself. Are you ready to change? <coughs> Excuse me. So this little exercise is going to help you understand the six different ways that people manage change or they cope with change. And in this webinar, we're going to look at four of them in detail and it'll make sense why we're only going to look at four rather than six. So are you ready to change? So think about some change that happened recently in your professional life. Okay, so in your professional life, some change happened and I'd like you to just think about it. So I'm not asking you to share in any way, but how did you deal with it? So what did you do? What was the change and how do you deal with it? So I'm not asking you to share here, just like you to think about it for yourself, because I'm now going to go through the six ways that people typically deal with change and it'll fall into one of these six categories. Okay, so I'm sure you've got that. Uh, so let me give you the example that will set the frame for this. So um, a change that's happening in many people's lives is, of course, people have got smartphones. And let me pick, pick a particular example of two businesses that face the situation of everybody is on their smartphone all the time. And they, these two businesses dealt with it very differently. And they're both cafes. So they're cafes, people are coming in, they're ordering, but they're on their smartphone. And so it's difficult for the cafe staff to take orders because people are distracted, people are focused. They say, oh, let me send this text first before I put in my coffee order. And of course, it gets the staff upset, it gets other customers upset, and so on. So here are the ways the two cafes face that change situation, face a situation, and here are the two changes. So one of them is a cafe in Terrigal, and this made the news, uh, and what they did, what the manager of that cafe did, was he put a sign on his cash register saying, if you're on the phone at the counter, it's rude, so I'm going to charge you more. Okay, that's one way to bring the change, to, to cope with that change, he said, we'll penalize you. The second one was uh, my local cafe, a juggler down here in Perth, and uh, they had a similar situation. Everyone was coming in with their smartphone. Um, and what Nino did was he said, instead of penalizing people, let's take advantage of this situation. And so he was, he teamed up with the people at Rewardle and uh, Rewardle had these little coffee loyalty cards that actually weren't cards. So they were an app on your phone where you just scan your phone and you earned points towards free coffees. Okay, so this now, of course, there are a lot of cafes and 
restaurants that do this. But at the time, a few years ago, this was quite new and innovative and revolutionary. And Nina said, let's take advantage of the fact that people are on their phone all the time. How can we how can we use that? Okay, so what about you? So which of these two are you? Uh, are you the person who says, I don't like the change, so I'm going to do something, but it's going to restore the status quo, or somebody else who says, um, not sure about the change, but let's see if we can turn that into a positive. Okay, so those are two of the six options. Let me go through the six of them, and then we'll see which one you fell into. Okay, so the first three are things that you shouldn't do. So don't ignore change. Don't assume that the world is going to go on um, exactly the same as it always has, and you just go, no, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I'm not, I'm just going to pretend that change isn't happening. If you're on this webinar, I assume that's not true for you. Pretty sure that's not true for you. It might be true for some of your people, but we're not going to cover that one. And the second one are the people who try to run away from change or hide from it. They know the change is there, but they do everything they can to avoid it. Um, and that can work in the short term, but in the very short term. And sometimes running away from change is going out of that change frying pan into a much worse environment, a much worse fire. Okay, so don't avoid change and also don't resist it. So this is what that guy in Terrigal did. He said, I don't like the change, so I'm going to do something. So he's actually being active about it, but he's going to res resist it by trying to restore the status quo. Now the next three are th three things which are good. So another thing you could do is adapt to change or manage change. So in the cafe example, what you could do is say to your staff, if somebody's on their phone at the counter, just politely move on to the next customer and come back to that first customer when they're ready. Okay, that, that would be a way to adapt to change. The next one is what Nino did, and he said, let's embrace the change. Let's see, this change has happened. Let's not treat it as a problem. Let's see if we can take advantage of it and do something with that change to help move us forward, and maybe even to give us a little bit of a competitive edge. And the best thing that you can do, and this is not coping with change, this is actually creating the change. So if you lead the change, if you're the one that makes change happen and leaves everybody else in your trail, fantastic. Most of us don't get the chance to do that or don't get the chance to do that very often. Okay, so those are the six ways that you could manage change. We're going to look at four of them. We're not going to do the ignore right at the number one, and we're not going to do the one of leading change. We'll do the four in the middle. But I'd like to know, how did you deal with that change? So I've got a poll for you. Before I show this poll, just keep in mind that this doesn't define the way that you always deal with change. So I'm going to ask you to go back to the situation uh, that I asked you to imagine at the start, where some change happened and you had to deal with it. If you had to categorize it into one of these, um, one of these categories. Okay, so let me launch the poll for you. Okay, and I've got this f this first five categories. Uh, which of them? would you think matched it best? Did you ignore it, like pretend the change didn't happen? Don't think so, I'm assuming that we won't get that many. Uh, did you run away from it? Did you try to restore the status quo? Did you find a way to work around it and adapt to it? Um, or did you embrace the change and say, say it was a positive, so what can we do about it? So I'm close to my 80% mark, which is what I wait for to close the poll. We've got it. Okay, great. So let me show you the responses. Uh, so this is not, uh, let me share the responses with you. So this is not representative of most people out there in the world. But it's not surprising for the people who sign up to a webinar about how to deal with change, okay? And uh, even if you're a leader or a senior manager and you've got people who are in those other categories, um, I'm not at all surprised that you say, that you're in this category. So you um, adapt to change uh, or you embrace change and find positives from it. Especially if you're a leader, then just keep in mind that just because you do this, other people don't. And that's why I want to give you strategies in four of the six areas that will help you um, deal with like other situations where you may not be adapting to it or embracing it, and also dealing with people in your team who aren't um, we don't quite know how to adapt or embrace change. Okay, so let's look at these six areas. Okay, so we're not going to look at that first one. We're not going to look at uh, the ignore. So people who ignore change and pretend it's not happening, let's not worry about them just yet. Um, we're going to look at the people who avoid change, and I'm gi I'll give you strategies for how to um, assist them and yourself as well. Uh, also people who resist change and try to restore the status quo. What can you do for them? 
and I'm calling those below the line. So ignore, avoid and resist are things are ineffective ways to manage change. They might work, but even if they work, they only work in the short term. What you really want to do is be above the line and adapt to change, embrace change, or ideally uh, lead the change. So I'm going to take away lead the change and we're going to look at these four here, avoid, resist, adapt and embrace. And for each of them, I'm going to give you some, some strategies to work through them. And just keep in mind, as, as I said, below the line um, are the, the things that we want to change. So people avoiding change, we want to change that. People who are resisting change, we want to change that as well. You know what? The people who are adapting to change and embracing change are doing pretty okay, doing pretty well. So for these two areas, when we get to these two, adapt and embrace, I'm going to give you ways to, to build on that. So people who are adapting to change, um, you don't have to get them to the point where they're embracing change. You don't have to move them up this uh, this ladder or these steps. Uh, it's quite okay for them to be adapting to change and just do it more effectively. Um, similarly, people are embracing change, fantastic. You don't need them suddenly to change, in, change into change leaders and then be a fish out of water because they're pretty good at embracing change. Okay, so the strategies for avoid and resist are going to help you move people out of that. The strategies for adapt and embrace are going to help you amplify that. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. I'm going to very briefly stop and just check if anyone's got any questions, comments, insights about what we've covered so far, in particular if you want me to clarify what any of those things mean. So, uh, because this is like our table of contents for the rest of the webinar. This is, this is our structure. The rest of the webinar is me going through avoid, resist, adapt and embrace. Okay, so let's see if there's any comments coming in. Yeah, so this person here, I'll just keep this comment anonymous as well, says, uh, I know that I adapt to change, but my team members resist it. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's not a question, but it's just a comment, which is, which is again quite common. So um, as a leader, you might find that because you know that change is, is essential, that you are really pushing for it and you build skills to be able to deal with it higher up this hierarchy, but the people on your team haven't yet uh, realized and recognized that they need to come on the journey and even if they have, they don't know exactly what to do. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay, let's let's look at these four areas. For each of them, I'm going to give you some practical strategies. Okay, so if, if you've got people who are avoiding change or if you're avoiding change in some situations, then what can you do? Very broadly, build resilience. So there's a lot of talk about resilience at the moment. How do we get more resilient? How do we um, bounce back when, the, when we have setbacks? How do we make sure that we can um, pull ourselves up when we get knocked over? And that's, resilience is useful. It's not everything. And uh, it doesn't, it doesn't solve all the change problems because being resilient is fine, but you don't want to be always being knocked over so you can bounce back. What you want to be doing is moving forward as well. But resilience has its place and this is where it is. Okay, so if you've got people who are avoiding change or you're avoiding change, you're trying to run away from change, then resilience is one of the best things that you can build in them. So, um, and resilience is just the ability to be able to face changes and setbacks and be able to come back from them. And it's especially useful if there are people avoiding it. They're trying to run away from it because they're worried that they won't be able to survive change. Resilience will Will give them tools to be able to manage that. Okay, so first thing, framing around resilience is that life is all about change. This is a dictionary definition of life and life is blah, 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 blah. It requires blah, 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 blah and continual change preceding death. So change is just a normal everyday part of life. If we're not changing, it's because we're not living. So yeah, change is happening it, it, it is part of life, it's part of the definition of what distinguishes us from things that aren't living. So uh, yeah, so, and it's easy, again, it's easy for me to say that, but it's useful to have that, uh, that perspective that change is, is normal, change is normal. But if you want some practical strategies for building resilience, I'm going to give you three of them here. Okay, and so the three strategies, and we'll go through them um, individually, is to get some dis distance or perspective to take baby steps towards change and then find a support network. Now, there are people who run full day workshops, longer than full day workshops about resilience, and there's a lot more to resilience than this. But these three things, 
just briefly, if you put them into practice, they'll make a big difference to you in terms of building your resilience. So let's talk about them. So the first one here is getting distance or perspective. Okay, and this simply saying that when you're caught up in the middle of all the change, it's not easy to the old saying, can't see the wood for the trees because you're stuck in the middle of the forest and you can't see the big picture. So let me give you two perspective building tools or two distance building tools. So one of them is to, is to give you distance through time. So what will this change mean for you? And this is a question to ask yourself about the, about the change that's happening. If you're feeling stressed about it, what will it mean for you 10 minutes from now, 10 months from now, and 10 years from now? So if I go back to some of the things that people said, so what are the changes that you're facing? There's some EBA discussions, as one person said, um, there's some significant high level strategic changes that are happening. And so these are people, so remember these are people in your team who are feeling stressed by that and ask them to ask themselves, what will this change mean to you? Like immediately in the short term, in the short term, it may be a bit of pain. Um, 10 months from now, it may be that people are still adjusting to it. 10 years from now, you might say, actually, you know, that was a very, very minor thing that happened 10 years ago and it's no big deal. Or you might say, actually, there was a, there was a situation there that means that 10 years, like now, I'm really glad that change happened because as a result of that, my life is so much better, blah, 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 or so much worse, blah, blah, blah. There's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just giving people a different perspective on it. Okay, and the idea here is the perspective comes from time. Um, as people sometimes say, you know, comedy is tragedy plus time, right? So a lot of stand-up com comedy is based on people talking about things that were painful in their life that they've now been able to see, get some perspective and see the funny side of it. Now, you don't have to go that extreme, but what you're doing is you're giving yourself that, that external perspective. So if you're coaching your people through change, that's this is one of the strategies that you can use. If you're coaching yourself through change, this is one of the strategies you can use. The other strategy around giving distance is distance. So we talked about distance by time. How about distance by looking at it from somebody else's perspective? So what would, so you're here, you've got this problem here. So this is metaphorically, you're trying to put the square peg into this round hole and you don't know what to do. And you've run out of ideas, uh, you're stuck, you're stuck. So this, there's this problem that you're trying to solve. In this case, we're talking about a change problem. And the question is, what would somebody else do in this situation. So in relationships, for example, relationship counselors, uh, they might ask you the question, what would your best friend advise you to do in this situation? Would you say, yeah, you got to break up with him? Or would he say, and yeah, mate, you got to stick in there. Um, the question, another question might be, what would um, somebody who is your hero say or do in this situation. So what you're doing is you're channeling uh, somebody else's perspective. And it doesn't mean that you have to go and ask your best friend or ask your hero. All you're doing is taking yourself out of the situation and imagining what that person would say. Um, so for example, I worked with a group of students. I don't do a lot of work with uh, school students, but I did this one workshop with them and they were talking about study and how they get stressed when they're coming up to exams. And we were talking about stress management techniques. And I said, okay, let's do this exercise. Size. So, you know, who's your hero and what would they do in this situation? And one of the students, she said to me, um, well, my hero is Harry Potter. And so my question was, what would Harry Potter, what would Harry do in this situation? And she came up with three things that Harry would do that would, that helped her reduce the stress in her situation. Now, she wasn't in any way channeling Harry Potter or J.K. Rowling. Uh, literally, she wasn't writing to Rowling and saying, or reading the Harry Potter books to look for examples. What she was doing is, uh, it was all out of her own imagination, but she was able to step out of her, her role as a student studying for exams and say, what would Harry Potter do in this situation? Okay, so these two exercises, even though they seem like all you're doing is imaginary, so giving yourself distance, uh, distance from time or distance from somebody else's perspective, they can be so valuable. Let me see if there's any questions or comments about that. Okay, so let me, I won't stop after everyone, but this is a, such a powerful tool that uh, it's worth just checking if anyone wants me to clarify anything or if anyone wants to say anything uh, to add to that. OK, 
Okay, so I don't see anything coming in at this stage, so I'm just going to um, continue, but feel free to uh, add your comments in the comment box if you in the question box if you want to even later, and I'll, I'll keep circling back to them as we go. It's one of the nice things about webinars is that you can write your questions in as often as you want to, whenever you want to, and I can come back to them and then uh, respond to them later in the webinar. Okay, so that's the first thing is to give yourself distance. And the second thing is to take baby steps. Again, remember we're talking about people who are avoiding change here, who are trying to run away from it. So, you know, the babies, they learn to run by doing a lot of crawling, then they learn to walk, and then only after that can they run. Again, it seems like a very, very simple example, but if you're running away from change, if you're escaping change, then, and you want to change that behavior, then you're not going to do it by immersing yourself in the biggest change possible, okay? You're not trying to um, jump into freezing cold water to to get used to the water. What you're trying to do is you do, you're do you taking baby steps first, right? You dip your toe in, no, let's, let's not mix metaphors here, uh, you crawl first, then you walk, then you run. So find ways to do little bits of change, and it may not be change at work, it might be that you do a little bit of change um, in your personal life and then just see how it feels, because a lot of this is around feeling. It's about the feeling and the emotion that goes into change, because we all know how to change and we all change all the time. It's just sometimes our emotions don't allow us to change because they're trying to protect us from what the change is going to create for us. And that's why people avoid change. Um, for the same reason, look for support. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean professional support from counsellors, but it could mean a support network of people who can who are going through similar change and who can help each other. So what you don't want is you don't want to have a pity party. So you don't want to have a whole bunch of people who are going, woe is me, change is coming, our lives are going to be destroyed, we're going to lose our jobs, our we won't be able to support our families. What you want are people who can help you uh, with these strategies, with these resilience strategies, okay? And the best way to start is just with one or two people and, uh, and then use some of these strategies. They don't have to be people within your team either. Sometimes it's really useful to have diverse people from outside your team, so from outside your the same network because their perspective might be quite different. Okay, and then the last thing I'll say about building resilience, there's this quotation which is um, not quite sure who uh, it originated from, but the person it's most attributed to is Ian McLaren, uh, who says, be kind for everybody you meet is fighting their own battle or fighting a hard battle. So you don't know what's happening in other people's lives. And I want you to apply this, specifically the reason I'm sharing it in this webinar is because I think that the person you should be most kind to is yourself. Uh, if you're avoiding change, if you're running away from it, then don't expect that you can snap your fingers and completely change around to be able to embrace change. Okay, so I've spent quite a bit of time on that first one because it is there are a lot of people who are in this stage where they're avoiding change. They're, they, they're running away from it because change is too scary for them. There are also some people in this other, in the next level up, which is they, they understand change is there and what they're doing is they're resisting it. So they want to, they want to take action about the change, but the action is trying to bring them back to the way things used to be. Uh, so what you do there for them or for you, if you're in that situation, is to reframe their actions because they recognize change and they're actually doing stuff. They might even be, be quite creative about what they're doing, it's just that their creativity and their actions are channeled to bringing things back to the way they were. So is there a way to reframe it, to rechannel uh, their actions so that it's moving them in a positive direction rather than all their energy is going to pulling them back? Okay, so here we're going to talk about reframing here. And uh, the three reframes, and broadly speaking, look, I've got, I've got these under three different definitions, context reframe, meaning reframe, extreme reframe, but it doesn't matter what the, the labels that we attach to it. The big principle around it is to think about the change that's happening, to think about it differently, to have a different attitude towards the change, um, and that, that different attitude might give you different insights. So let, let's talk about these three, and the, but the basic principle is you're thinking differently about what the change means to you and uh, what it could mean because we're just we're making up the meaning of the change and if we change the meaning that we give to it then we can change our approach to it 
Okay, let me give you some concrete examples. So context reframe is simply saying in what situations is this appropriate? So is it appropriate for a parent to let their kids scream loudly on an aeroplane when they're playing? Okay, and there are other passengers around. Most people will say, no, that's not appropriate. But is it always inappropriate for kids to let their, um, for parents to let their kids scream loudly? Of course not. And, and there's a thing called inside voice, right? And you hear parents say, shh, inside voice. And that means there's, there's a time that's appropriate and a time that is not. Uh, so what you're looking for is un, in what context is this a good thing? Because we're talking about people who are resisting change, so they're seeing change as a bad thing. And what con in what context is that a good thing? For example, a hammer is a tool. And a, ta a hammer can be used to, to shatter things and to break them, or it can be used to help make things. And is a hammer good or bad? Well, there's no right answer to that. It just depends on the context in which it's being used. Is this change good or bad? Well, it's, it's not objectively good or bad. It just depends on the context in which it's been used. So let's go back to our example of people who are on their mobile phones all the time. So is it bad that somebody's on their mobile phone when you're in their in their environment as well? Now, this uh, is, is that a context where it's inappropriate? So in a cafe where somebody's waiting for you to order and you're on your phone, that may not be an appropriate um, behavior. But in what context is it okay for you to be on your phone when there are other people around? Well, there are tons of them. You could be on public transport and all you're doing is you're checking your phone while you're traveling somewhere. It could be that you're the second or the third person in line at the cafe and you're on your phone and uh, you're not holding up anybody else, you're not distracting anybody else. It's completely appropriate. So what you're looking for are contexts where that, that behavior is appropriate. And Looking for these contexts, it just sounds like you're just playing this mental game, and it's not just that. It's just it's the the idea is to reframe the thinking around. Oh, she's on her phone. That's a bad thing. It's not true. Um, or you say kids are always they're on their phone. They never look up and they never talk in real life. Well. There are times where they're actually communicating, they're just communicating in different ways. Now, obviously, there are times when that's inappropriate, but there may be times when that's good as well. So we're looking for different contexts where that change is appropriate. So if you're going through a restructure um, and you say that restructure is really bad because it's going to be really bad for my team um, and really bad and my job might be at risk. But is there a context where the restructure is appropriate? Maybe there is. Maybe there for the company to succeed and to survive, it needs to go through that restructure. And the context is that the bigger picture is that restructure is good. Okay. And again, it doesn't mean that uh, you can say, well, I've now I've seen that it's good. Therefore, magically, everything's okay. It's not, but it's just giving you a different perspective. Okay, that's a context reframe. And the next one's a meaning reframe. So this is saying, instead of saying that change, change means something bad, could it actually mean something good? And again, it's not assigning a judgment to the change. It's trying to remove the emotion from the change so you can look more objectively at it. For example, there's a story, and the story, again, is attributed to various places. I've heard this about in uh, ancient China, where a farmer, um, a farmer inherits a horse. Okay, so a friend dies, which is a bad thing, um, but as a result of that, um, he leaves his friend, who's a farmer, um, his prize horse. And uh, so, so then everyone says to the farmer, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that your friend died, but isn't it good that you've got this horse? And the farmer goes, is it bad or is it good? Um, and then the farmer's horse ra runs away. And so his friends come to him and goes, oh, so sorry to hear that your horse has run away. And the farmer shrugs and goes, is it bad or is it good? And then the farmer comes back, uh, the horse comes back with another, a wild horse. And now the farmer's got two horses and the friends go, fantastic, great news. The farmer goes, is it bad or is it good? Um, but then the, the son who was riding the wild horse, um, the wild horse jumped and the son fell off and broke his leg and then his friends come to commiserate and uh, they say that's terrible news and the farmer shrugs and goes is it bad or is it good and then as a result the country goes to, to war and the town the townspeople are called on but the son isn't called up for war because of his broken leg and so again is it bad or is it good so the point I'm making here is that circumstances happen change happens decisions have to be made 
um, circumstances change, and the way that the way that we think about it, the meaning that we give give to it, can affect the way that we act as a result of it. So again, going back to the uh, cafe example, remember in this cafe, the the cafe in Terrigal, the manager said this is a this means somebody on their phone means that they're rude. He's actually used the word rude. Okay, but is that person being rude? Well, maybe from some people's perspective. And when this story did make the media, there were a lot of people supporting this cafe manager saying, just it's about time. Yeah, these young people, they're on their phone all the time. It's about time that someone took a stand uh, against them or a to do something about it. Okay, but rude is just a personal judgment call on a situation. And uh, you can you can have a different meaning attached to it. So what are other meanings that you have? And we talked about that. Okay, and the last one, which is this extreme reframe, is this idea of saying, so this is not always easy, but it's like playing this game where you say, this is exactly what we need. Okay, so instead of seeing the change as something you want to resist, you say, wow, that's exactly what we need. Do we need restructures? Uh, do we need restructure? Instead of being resisting, uh, resistant to it, it uh, can say, that's exactly what we need. And then somebody else goes, why? How can that be? Uh, and then you have to find reasons why that restructure uh, or whatever the change is could be a really positive thing. And let me pick another one. Um, so some business process change often uh, cause a lot of stress and strain and frustration for people and discomfort. Uh, but if you say that's exactly what we need and then try to find a way to justify it. Um, I'm going back to the other comments that people made. Here's another one around um, new ownership. So new ownership often brings with it a lot of change and uncertainty and a little bit of fear. Um, I know this person and that she's not necessarily feeling those things, but I do know that uh, many people feel that way when there is new ownership. And you go, new ownership, that's exactly what we need. And then you have to find a way to justify it. Um, let's see another one. Oh yeah, here's somebody, actually somebody I know from New Zealand. Uh, so. This is kind of coming back to an earlier pro, um, question I said. So the you know the what would so and so do? Um, you could use that to empathise with others who don't. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that's putting yourself in their shoes as well. So especially if you're a leader, um, if this whole webinar is about if you're if you're a leader and you have to bring people along on the change journey as we all do, then it's essential that we put ourselves in their perspective rather than our own when you want to help them make the change. Okay, so I'm going to stop now for any questions around that. So um, this idea of reframing, we're going to move on to now the, the positive side of it above the line. We're going to spend less time in these two areas around adapting to change and embracing change because the people you really want to bring along are the people who are avoiding, so trying to run away from it, or the people who are resisting change. So we spent most of our time in this area, which is what I wanted to do. And any comments or questions from the, uh, from what we've covered so far? Remember the idea of avoiding is to, uh, or the strategies are around resilience and the resistance uh, is, is all about reframing. Yeah, so the, there's a comment here that says that reframing and resilience are both about different perspectives. And yeah, they actually are. So reframing is very much about uh, saying that it's about taking action, but taking different action, uh, depending on the frame that you put around. Um, and you're, yeah, so I, it's not only about perspective, but it's also about um, the emotion that you have around change. Because people who are avoiding and resisting change, they see change as being worse than not changing. So what they want to do is not change. And they don't recognize that not changing can be riskier than changing. So what we're trying to do for both, in both cases, for resi so building resilience so that they'll actually get onto the journey, um, and for overcoming resistance, which is the reframing bit, is for them to understand that that change could be positive. There's a whole idea behind that, you know, bring it on, that's exactly what we need, is to get people out of that feeling that change is bad. So a generation ago, not changing was a really useful strategy, but now it's just not anymore. We have to change, we have to adapt, because otherwise the world's gonna move on past us. Okay, so let's move on to these 
Uh, oh, okay, great. Uh, Okay, Fran, I will say that this is fabulous tools and empowering people to come on the journey to change. Yeah, thanks, Fran. Thanks. And these, these are really practical tools, which is the purpose of this webinar. Um, let's move on to these other two areas, which I don't want to talk about in a lot of detail, but let, let's talk about them briefly. So the next one is how you, so these are people who adapt to change and that's fine. Great, fantastic that they're adapting to change. Just help them, just give them more problem solving skills. So they're already open to the idea that change is happening and we need to adapt to it. We need to find ways to work around it. Uh, so just teach them ways to do that more effectively. And uh, the modern way of solving problems, and I run a whole workshop on this, uh, so we won't go into that in detail, is to do it in small chunks. So start small, fail if you need to, but then pick yourself up and try again, rather than trying to solve massive problems. Um, if you want people to solve problems fast, uh, make sure you know what the outcome is, and then just do things fast. There's a, there's a term called ooching, and ooching is, I think it originally came from sailing. So um, I think that's where the term came from, but basically it means trying little things fast. So it's the exact opposite of jumping headfirst into something. So rather than uh, making a full 100% commitment to something, what you do is you try a little experiment. And you hear these terms now in modern uh, performance, productivity, innovation, um, build a prototype, run a little pilot project. And, and there are these processes which you may have come across, design thinking and lean startup, which are all around that. So lean startup, one of the big, biggest principles that people know about is you look for an MVP, the minimum viable product. And what you're looking for here is something that you say, uh, what's the, the smallest thing that I can get out there in the world that customers would value and they'd use, and let's put that out there. See what the customers say. Um, it may be a raving success, in which case we'll keep working on it and we'll keep doing that, or it may be a dismal failure, in which case we'll drop it and start again, knowing that we didn't commit much to it. So if you've got people who uh, you know adapt to change, and if you know that you're adapting to change, then learn some of these skills about you know, design thinking, learn about the lean startup and learn about ooching and actually do it. Okay, so do it, just do small, small projects fast to adapt to the change and try out little things. So in the cafe example, people on their phone, what can you do about it? Try different things. You might say, let's serve the customer next in line. You might say, um, what, else, what else might you say? You might say um, that you're going to have, allow people to send in their orders by phone. Uh, you might do a whole bunch of things that could work and you just try them. You just try them and see which ones do work. Okay, so the last area, and again, I won't spend a lot of time on this one because I want to spend most of our time on avoiding and resisting. And the main reason I'm sharing this with you is because I want to share with you this word anti-fragile. So if you've got people who are embracing change, or you're one of those people who embraces change in your organization or your team, then, um, these are the people who are anti-fragile. So you know what's something that's fragile? So something that's fragile is something that's very vulnerable to change. You shake it and it shatters, or you touch it and it falls apart. Anti-fragile is not something that's stable, that resists change, that's, uh, that's solid, that you shake it, it doesn't fall apart. It's exactly the, the opposite of fragile. Fragile is change happens, it falls apart. Anti-fragile is it needs change to happen for it to flourish and grow. Okay, now that sounds like a really counterintuitive thing, so much so that that word anti-fragile didn't even exist until about a decade ago when this guy um, who wrote the book The Black Swan, uh, Nicholas Taleb, wrote this book anti-fragile, and it's called Things That Gain From Disorder. So, you know, people who invest, who trade on the stock market, they rely on shares guys, uh, sh stocks going up and down because they rely on the volatility in order to make money because they're relying on that uh, rise or fall. And they'll make money in a rising market, they'll make money in a falling market, um, but they rely on some volatility. If there's, if there's no change, then it's very difficult for them to make money. It, it relies on disorder. There aren't many things in your life that are anti-fragile, but the people who embrace change, they love that change is happening all around them, and they're eagerly looking forward to it. They're bored if you don't have 
change. So very quickly, let me give you three strategies for you to be more anti-fragile. So if you're the person who already embraces change, fantastic. These are things that you can use for yourself. If you're a team leader or a manager and you've got these anti-fragile people in the organization who get fidgety if change isn't happening, then here are things that you can get them to do as well. Okay, so um, the three things, break something, find a reverse mentor and fire yourself. So if you want to be more anti-fragile, then change some of your habits. In fact, make change a habit. Right? So instead of always doing things the same way all the time, do things differently. Next time you go out and order a coffee, order something that you wouldn't normally order. So don't do your standard coffee order, try something different. Um, that's one simple thing. When you go to work, try a different way of going to work. Um, then, and this wear some clothes, uh, uh, accessorize in a way that you wouldn't otherwise, mix and match in a way you wouldn't otherwise. So make change a habit and, and get the feeling of what it's like to be okay with change. The second thing that you can do, uh, especially if you're senior and experienced, is to have a reverse mentor. So reverse mentoring says instead of doing the traditional mentoring where the senior person mentors a more junior person, do it the other way around, where the more junior person mentors and they share their particularly the different perspective with the more senior person in the team. Um, and the idea is, again, gets Ideally, like more junior often means the younger person and the younger person is the one and you know this generation Y and generation Z, they love change. They, they live for it. They're bored if there isn't change happening. So if you've got those people in your team or in your life, then bring them on board. Let them mentor you uh, because they are already anti-fragile. They're already thinking about uh, change and they, they love change to happen. So my last little quotation around this is a quotation from an American author, Upton Sinclair, and he says it's pretty, it's, it's hard to get somebody to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. And um, I'm sharing this here right at the end because it's, you know, it, it seems odd, it seems counterintuitive, but the idea is that lots of people don't want to change because they know that change is a risk to them personally. And uh, they will put on blinkers, they will refuse to accept something that could be a risk to them. And again, if you want to be more anti-fragile, expose yourself to things that might be a risk to you. And this is exactly why I say, you know, this is like firing yourself. So if you didn't have this job and then you had to make this decision more objectively and your salary wasn't uh, riding on it, your family and your lifestyle wasn't riding on it, um, what would you do and how would you act? And again, anti-fragile people just go, well, I don't really care what's happened in the past. Uh, I'll, I see this opportunity, so I'm going to take it. Not easy to do, but um, if you want to be more anti-fragile, then do it. Okay, so let me just quickly see comments and questions. Uh, yeah, Nancy says we'll have access to this webinar. Yes, I'll have the recording available to you. Um, okay, so just to summarize, so I'd like to know what are you going to do now? So we've covered these four things around avoiding change, resisting change, adapting to change, and embracing change. Um, just want to ask you, in the if you type in the question box, and again I'll keep this anonymous, um, which what will you do? What practical things will you take on board and do? Okay, so um, I see a question, how do you multiply the embraces and adapters? And this whole thing, Kavita, is around, uh, is around uh, creating the environment for that. Uh, and I know like your role as a senior leader uh, is about creating that environment. So it's not about you necessarily, but the people in the organization and the team. Um, yeah, people are saying, can I share some of these tools? Absolutely. So when you get the recording, feel free to um, share it around with your team as well. Uh, person, somebody here, Kevin is anonymous, says make change a habit is something that they're going to do. I want to be more of an embrace instead of just adapting. Fantastic. Uh, reframing is really useful. I continue the helicopter view, take a step back and look from a distance. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I, I feel like my work here is done because the people have taken away some, some practical actions that they can put into place, which is exactly what I wanted from this webinar. And uh, there's some people on this webinar already, some of the leaders who are already part of my Disruption by Design coaching program, which is a monthly program for leaders where we work together and we look at these three areas about being fit for the future, uh, the skill of foresight, uh, bringing people on board, which is about talent, and then 
uh, how do you take action um, and the three elements of the program you get access to me so anytime you want to email me or call me um, use me as a sounding board you can uh, every month we get together and we have the, you get the access to your peers and we some co and coach you through and one of these ideas around disruption by design and you get input from your peers as well and then every month I also run a skills webinar for your team members for your staff and that's exactly what we're doing now so this is one of the skills webinars that I run for people who are in the program and occasionally I open them up to other people like I'm doing today but mostly they're private webinars like really high value webinars to help your staff uh, managed through disruption, change, and innovation. If you'd like to find out more about that, um, just check out futurereadyleaders.today or you can get in touch with me. So thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, all my contact details at gihanperera.com. Please drop me a line if you find that useful. Please drop me a line if you'd like to find out about uh, find out more about the program. Uh, but most importantly, I hope you've got some really practical things for yourself and your team to be able to manage change effectively. Thanks everyone. Bye for now.